Hello friends, uh, welcome to the Hindu Daily News Analysis. Today is 1st May 2018. So, first about myself. Uh, my name is Sagar P. Ashworth. I'm a tutor at Shiksha IS Academy. I'm a faculty for Psychology, Indian Economy and Ethics. To start off, on a positive note, a saying by Confucius, the man who moves a mountain begins by carrying away small stones. So this is important in the sense that you have to take smaller steps, so take smaller steps to uh, make a huge leap towards the end. So I do using the codes on a daily basis it would be useful for you uh, to write the answers in your ethics paper as well as your essay paper you can use these quotes right I would be including only the relevant quotes right what will be covered in today's analysis the first topic would be the Korean Thor this talks about the two countries the North Korea and South Korea you know, setting aside all the differences they have and uh, you know they are getting closer or they are uh, showing a reconciliatory posture and uh, this is backed by most of the countries the Western countries which had reservations towards North Korea so far the other article is the headline grabber this is more of a political nature, so we'd be not dealing with this part. The next one is a dangerous incursion. This is about the elevation of one Justice K.M. Joseph. Uh, he has been denied uh, the elevation and uh, this is written by Mr. Kapil Sibyl. Obviously, he is the opposition leader. So this article is mostly critical of the government's stance. A shared hero for India and Pakistan. This is about Bhagat Singh. So <clears throat> the details about Bhagat Singh can be found in your history books. Just go through the details of uh, which uh, organizations he started and his contribution to the freedom struggle. So I am not going into details of this particular article. The other article which we dwell deeper into is the local democracy in disarray. It has been almost two and a half decades since we started this you know, great uh, reform process and where do we stand now, right? So what are the problems the local self-governments are facing, in particular the rural local self-governments. And the other article uh, on the op-ed page is that of the cost of pollution. It talks about the environmental business curve, what India has done so far and what should India do with regard to environmental pollution and conservation. So that will be covered here. And then you have the conclave of southern states or recently uh, that is in the start of April. The finance ministers uh, came together to show southern solidarity, right? Uh, However, some you know, chief ministers, sorry, some finance ministers uh, did not attend this. We are going to look into details of this, why these states are coming together now, right? The call for Dravid and Ordu. So we'll be looking into those aspects. So the first article, Korean Thaw. So there was this historic meeting uh, which happened between the North Korean and the South Korean leader. So here are the North Korean and the South Korean leaders. So Kim Jong-un and uh, the South Korean president here, right? So this is called uh, historic for several reasons. So it was significant uh, in the sense that it has been decades uh, since a North Korean leader has uh, stepped into South Korea, right? It was a long back right it was since 1953 armistice agreement 
none of the North Korean leader has entered the South Korean soil, right? <clears throat> the, uh, both the countries, as of now, intend to secure peace in the peninsula. So what led to this animosity to tone down and both the countries walking towards truce now? But this rapid turnaround in the ties between the two Koreas comes with a backdrop, right? Until recently, uh, the South Korea, which is supported by US, or which sees it as an ally in Asia, was on a rather, uh, you know, monumental proportions, uh, on monumental proportions, was not happy with North Korea, especially with the nuclear weapons program of North Korea. So Mr. Kim Jong-un, who assumed the power in 2011, uh, has embarked on this nuclear weapons program, which has been rather intensive. Last year, Mr. Trump and uh, Kim Jong-un exchanged uh, you know, heated words on Twitter, right? There were open threats made by both the countries. So the change of stance now uh, should be seen in the context of what North Korea wants. North Korea does not want to live in hostile, you know, environment forever. It wants to, you know, bargain its nuclear capability with some economic and security assurances. As we all know, uh, North Korea uh, faces several sanctions from the you know, rest of the world, barring China. China has some close relationships uh, with North Korea, barring China, none of the other countries have close relationship with North Korea. So Kim Jong-un sees that it is impossible to continue like this. They have to go for economic development. If that is to be made possible, obviously they have to give up this nuclear program and they have to build ties you know, start you know building bridges with the rest of the world so the recent agreement we are talking about or the recent declaration is the panmunjom declaration between the north korean and the south korean leader the declaration states that there would be no war in peninsula and uh, it would be a nuclear free peninsula so the nuclear cover for South Korea is given by its ally US. They want to transform the existing armistice, uh, which was signed in 1953, into a peace treaty. So the help to sign this peace treaty would come from US and China, and this would formally end the Korean War. So what is this agreement we are talking about, the 1953 armistice agreement? So it was only intended for a temporary, you know, truce. So it led to suspension of open hostilities, a uh, fixed demarcation line of four kilometers as a buffer zone was drawn, which is called the demilitarized zone. So it is where you have the demilitarized zone. So this is the, you know, largest demilitarized zone in the world. It also included a mechanism for the transfer of war, or prisoners of war, right? It's not like this is the first time the two countries have set to form the peace process. Earlier efforts were made, but they fell apart. Two South Korean presidents have traveled to the North, right? Ever since the 1953 uh, armistice agreement. The most significant was the 2007 Joint Declaration, uh, which amongst its objectives included the nuclear issue as well. But, uh, you know, the peace process was derailed because uh, not, many, um, not much progress was made and uh, North Korea, you know, went back to its usual way of developing its nuclear weapons program. It is seen from a different prison this time around uh, for reasons uh, quite you know visible one such reason is that 
Mr. Trump has shown his desire to meet uh, Mr. Kim and uh, to resolve the issue, right? He has shown some desire. And also, before the start of the summit, that is Panmun uh, Pan Jong summit, the North Korean leader also discussed the issues with China. So it means that almost all the stakeholders here are on board. The bigger countries, the smaller countries are all on board. To show his seriousness, uh, Mr. Kim uh, has said that he's going to put a freeze on the nuclear test he's going to do. And uh, he would also uh, stop the main test site, North Korea's main test site, as soon as this, you know, uh, talks go well. You have to keep in mind uh, that the dictatorial regime in North Korea will not be you know, giving too much wiggle room for peace process. They have a parking chip that is the nuclear program. Until and unless credible guarantees are given by US, China and other countries, his, he will not be willing to give up his nuclear program. He's also you know, inclined to press on the issue related to the withdrawal of you know, the nuclear umbrella, which is extended by the US on the South, that is the South Korean. What questions can be possibly framed on this issue? The uneasy relations between Korean neighbors seems to be ebbing with the softening of stance by both the countries critically analyzed. So you have to tell that the stakeholders in this game include China and US as well. So they have softened stance as well. So this would open up the space for peaceful resolution of the you know animosity which the two countries share. The next article is a dangerous incursion. So this deals with the issue of elevation of Justice K. M. Joseph. Uh, this Justice K. M. Joseph is the Chief Justice of the as of now, and uh, he was recommended by the Supreme Court Collegium uh, to be made the Supreme Court Judge. But the government has denied uh, such, you know, elevation. Uh, Warburton what has the Supreme Court Collegium said? It has said that uh, this person, that is King Joseph, he is uh, deserving and suitable in all respects other than, uh, than other Chief Justice and Senior Pion Judges of all the High Courts of India. So it looks like, you know, it's not based on the seniority they have chosen King Joseph, it's on the basis of the quality of the individual. So as soon as the government said, oh, I know they are not accepting or they have kept the elevation on hold, the opposition started to sharpen its knives against the government. So Justice Joseph uh, pronounced a historic judgment in April 2016 where he struck down the imposition of president's rule in Uttarakhand. So the Uttarakhand was ruled by Congress then, and uh, the central government imposed the president's rule. And uh, he actually said, he in his work said that it was unconstitutional to impose president's rule. So the central government was not happy with this. So this is one point on which the opposition attacks the government as of now. The other aspect uh, is that of the independence of judiciary, right? It is the independence of judiciary which is brought into question, right? So what is this independence of judiciary? Uh, what, do, what does it have to do with this issue? So because the central government is not elevating him, the judgments which are going to come from the high courts will be rather pressurized by the central government in the coming days so the independence of judiciary would be uh, would be uh, in a rather bad state 
So what are the grounds on which the government, you know, did not accept the recommendation of uh, the collegium? One is the point of seniority. However, this argument falls flat because the recommendation was completely based on qualities of the judge and moreover it's not the sole benchmark which has been used in the earlier times as well but most recently in february 2017 when judges deepak gupta and navin sinha were appointed there were other 40 high court judges who were senior to them and yet these two judges were elevated to the supreme court so that was that is one argument which the government has and uh, that falls flat there's a second argument which the government uses that is related to regional representation so the government says that few states are not represented in supreme court so kerala is already separate you know represented so there is no room for kerala's high court you know kerala's judge to be on the supreme court you know supreme court judges panel so again you know there have been slew of elevations from kerala high court right uh, and uh, you know it's not the first time uh, they are using this uh, so as to say the small high courts you know argument right <clears throat> the third is the inadequate representation of sc and st again it is flawed why because the total sanction strength of uh, the supreme court is around 31 judges at the moment, there are still six vacancies, right? And uh, due this year or six retirements. So total judges would be remaining uh, at the end of the year would be around 19. So 12 vacancies to be filled. If the government chooses SC and ST candidates for these 12 vacancies, nobody is there to stop them, right? So they have this wiggle room. This government has the wiggle room. So in conclusion, what can be said is that the reasons for not letting uh, Joseph Kurian to be part of the Supreme Court are rather malified. Uh, they, are, they are of malified intentions. It shows that the Supreme Court uh, proceedings, so as to say the appointment procedures in the Supreme Court uh, are being tinkered with by the executive. And this is going to set a very bad precedent so going forward, the central government might as well, you know, use this to appoint only those high court judges who are in favor of them. And also it harms the, uh, you know, uh, democracy and also it harms the autonomy of the entire judiciary. Why? Because these are extra constitutional pressures, right? The political parties imposing pressure on the judiciary, right? So these are the conclusions you can draw. So what question can you, you know, expect from this particular article? It is imperative that the executive does not wait too much into the higher judicial appointments for it might threaten the autonomy of judiciary and consequently the democracy discuss. So your answers have to be on these lines. Right, next. A conclave of the southern states. So the call for Jabodonado was made by the southern states uh, because they thought that their interests were being ignored by New Delhi, that is the union government. So to show their solidarity, formally they called a meeting of finance ministers in Tiruvannandapuram. So the state finance ministers were uh, called in and uh, they met at Tiruvannandapuram mm -hmm. and their main bone of contention is the terms of reference uh, which are given to the 15th finance commission. So the finance commission uh, is the one which is going to allocate the you know, divisible pool of taxes between the centre and the states. So the terms of reference extended to the Finance Commission, that is the 15th Finance Commission, is to use the 2011 census instead of the 1971 census. So this would actually cause losses to the southern states. That's what 
to a certain state's fee, how does it cause a loss? So in the 1971 census, uh, it can be seen that the southern states and the northern states have uh, the population almost similar to each other. However, over time, the southern states have made you know, significant efforts to bring down this you know, population. So now, if population is used as a parameter, the 2011 census or used as a parameter, it would actually hurt the southern states' finances when it comes to you know, devolution of a divisible pool of taxes. So another point is the support also is coming from other corners as well, not just the southern states. Significant is that of Chief Minister Mamata Banerjee extending the support. So it can be seen in the political light. So she is setting her eyes on the 2019 general election where she has intention to form a third front and nothing more than that. So why have these you know, states started to ask for a Dravid on Ardu? Obviously, the mechanisms, the other mechanisms to resolve the problems between the center and the states uh, have not worked or have failed. Not a very, you know, uh, not, uh, not an old thing, but the Interstate Council, which was set up uh, in November 2017, which is headed by Prime Minister, and uh, the members include six union ministers and uh, all the chief ministers of the states, has not done much. It has not widened the functions to solve the you know, state's issues. Even the zonal councils are restricted with the geographical scope. It also does not take up the issues related to the states. So the outstanding issues remain outstanding issues. Possible resolutions are not found here, right? So what should be done going forward? Going forward, you have to put these mechanisms to work. Right, these are constitutional mechanisms, statutory mechanisms. Put them to work. Right, uh, make sure that the states are heard properly and their issues get resolved. The question, possible question, is that is the call for drug denial justified in the light of recent developments? Comment on the issues raised by southern states. Right, is it justified? Obviously, no. Right. However, you have to add the caveats that their voices need to be heard, right? We have the objective of cooperative federalism. So you have to bring all the states on board while resolving the issues. The next topic is that of local democracy being in disarray. It has been two and a half decades since we started the two reform processes. One related to the economic reforms with the uh, you know, LPG, that is liberalization, privatization and globalization of 1991. The other which started soon after in 1993 that is related to the decentralization in India. The decentralization uh, was because of the 73rd and 74th constitutional amendments. Uh, they brought in parts 9 and parts 9a, part 9a to the constitution. The broad you know, provisions of these two amendments include elections would be held every five years once, reservations would be there for historically marginalized communities and women, there would be creation of participatory institutions like your Gram Panchayat, Panchayat Samiti, Gram Sabha, right? Uh, it would lead to establishment of state finance commissions, right? It would create district planning committees. So these would the broad provisions, right? All these provisions and the amendments aimed at uh, having the inclusive, responsive, uh, responsive, responsible participatory democracies, which, which would deliver economic development and social justice at the, ground, at the ground level, at the grassroots level. These self-governing structures were aimed at managing the local development. However, 
these things have been overrided many times and with impunity right who are the culprits here the culprits are both the central government and the state government <clears throat> so when you look at the economic and uh, decentralization reforms when you compare them the economic reforms have been rather successful why because we have seen the burgeoning of the gdp right it has seen unprecedented growth however the outcome part when it comes to healthcare, access to drinking water, education, food security, we do not see much of an outcome here. This is a social failure, economic success and a social failure. The social failure can be attributed to the lack in local democracy where the village panchayats have not succeeded in bringing the change. So why such a debacle or why such a failure what we see is with, re with regard to economic reforms there was considerable hand holding and support by the states and the center and also the bureaucracy when it comes to the fostering of decentralized governance promoting decentralized governance you do not see such hand holding and support also, from the beginning, uh, the provisions uh, which are constitutionally mandated, like you know, elections every five years, and uh, you know, uh, setting up SFCs, DPCs, these have been overrided by the states, and they have done it with impunity. It also appears as if the judiciary is not worried about it. Though the constitutional provisions are being violated, the judiciary seems to be, you know, rather indifferent. It is turning its face away from it, right? Apart from this, there are other problems as well. The rules and responsibilities of the local self governments are not defined properly, right? That is to say, you have three lists union list, the state list and the concurrent list. So some of the subjects in these lists are given to the state, uh, sorry, the local self-governments. So when they are accorded to local self-governments, they also have to, you know, mention what are the rules and responsibilities. So that part is not defined properly. In most cases, the states control the funds, functions and functionaries. Uh, this makes the local self-governments really really impossible to have autonomy apart from this most of the states have created parallel bodies uh, so that they infringe into the domain of local governments so they accord a subject to the local government but they create a parallel body which is going to monitor or uh, you know have a sort of stronghold on the local self-government so a point in case, uh, a case in point here is Haryana, which has created the Rural Development Agency. It is presided over the Chief Minister. Uh, it, enter, it enters the functional domain of the panchayats completely. Another problem is that of uh, redirecting the funds away from the panchayat raj institutions. So we have the MP large scheme and MLA large scheme. Uh, where the MPs and MLAs uh, get, you know, five crore rupees per year to spend in their particular constituency. However, uh, the problem is that the MPs and MLAs, you know, leave their funds unspent, and uh, because MLAs and MPs are the ones who are going to decide what works need to be done and where it is to be done, the wiggle room for panchayats is less again. And there is no mandate to create you know district planning committees uh, by taking into consideration the environmental conservation rural urban integration so these are not taken into consideration while district planning committee meets worse still in states like gujarat dpc has never been constituted so these are all the problems which afflict the you know local self governments Apart from this, you have the problems related to uh, devolution of taxes, also as to say, 
you know, when it comes to the divisible pool of taxes, the Finance Commission, right, under Article 280, is empowered to distribute the taxes. So the 11th Finance Commission asked for uh, reforms in budget and accounting, and uh, it wanted a credible fiscal database and a budget system, but this is in no sight when it comes to local self-government. And the 13th Finance Commission also linked the grants to local governments to the divisible pool uh, under Article 275. And it also uh, wanted to incentivize the process of decentralization, but not much work there. The 14th Finance Commission, it has enhanced the grant substantially to the local self governments However, to what extent are these measures working is something which is elusive for most of the uh, people who look into these aspects, right? Not much you know, progress has been made. So worse still, the terms of reference for 15th Finance Commission uh, is to abolish Article 275 altogether, right? So this would cause problems going forward. The reservations and revenue, when it comes to this part, the local self governments face a different set of problems. Though there are representations for Adivasis, Dalits, and women, the problem is that the atrocity rates and the cost of production rates have not gone down. They were, they were, you know, provisioned for this to act as active agents of social change. But in most cases, the Adivasis and Dalits are, are not given enough power. That is to say, uh, you have the you know upper classes controlling the Adivasis and Dalits, and in case of women the men households take over the power. When it comes to the expenditure part, as a percentage of total public expenditure, right, the local self governments spend are given the leeway to spend only 7% as compared to 24% in Europe, 27% in North America, and an outstanding 55% in Denmark. So that's very, very less. And the own revenue source, right, resource generation of local government is also very less. It's only 2%, which means for others, 5%, so 7 minus 2. So for this, so for this, 7 minus 2, 5%, it is dependent upon the center and the states. And if it is disaggregated for the rural areas, that is rural panchayat system, it is as negligible as 0.3%. Why are they not collecting the taxes? They have the power to collect the taxes, but they are not collecting it. Why? In some states, like Rajasthan, Punjab, Haryana, they have abolished the property taxes completely, right? This speaks of the physical weakness of the village panchayats. What can be the question on this aspect? Though the economic reforms and decentralization reforms in India started at the same time, the latter's success is relatively small. Delineate the reasons for its underperformance. The cost of pollution. <clears throat> so, pollution is a much bigger challenge in developing countries as compared to the developed countries. Why? We want rapid economic development. However, if we are to see from this angle, we will not be showing much regard to environment. Our sole aim is to develop economically first. To make this happen, we are going to overexploit the resources. We are going to dispose the waste indiscriminately so this would ultimately lead to pollution so this has led to you know led to us going beyond the carrying capacity of the environment what is this carrying capacity the carrying capacity of the environment is that where it can sustain 
can sustain the species of a uh, species without causing any degradation to the environment that is your carrying capacity so your carrying capacity of an ecosystem would be that a species which can be sustained a species the capacity of the an ecosystem to sustain a species without causing any degradation to the environment so india has taken several measures but not much significant process has been made for example you have the swachh bharat mission uh, cleaning ganga rejuvenation of ganga and then national mission for uh, on climate change uh, the national solar mission ujjwala yojana so these are all the measures but how forward have we moved is a question so what does the environmental kuznets curve say it says that as the per capita income of your country increases in the starting stages the environment starts to worsen there is a point at which there was a turn around right so your per capita income reaches a particular point right after that point the environment starts to improve that is the degradation of environment starts to fall so have we reached this point yet that's the question no we haven't we lie somewhere here we are still climbing in terms of per capita income the day we reach here probably we are going to you know conserve the environment and the environmental degradation starts to drop so should we wait till this point to take environmental conservation measures the article argues that that's not wise for us to do so why it's because in the last few decades we have adopted the industrialization process which in uh, which brings in the water intensive and poll polluting industries uh, the textile industries leather sugar paper industry so these have shifted from the developed world to the developing countries so you do not have that leverage of waiting till that per capita income point is reached you have to take measures soon otherwise the gains you are going to make through economic growth are going to be lost so what factors led to the shift the shift was because of a relatively less stringent environmental policies weak labor laws right and cheap labor as well so what are the economic and ecological losses which we can foresee the cost of treatment uh, which accrue from the health issues wages will be lost during the sickness agriculture and livestock is going to i know suffer suffer because of the pollution climate change will have you know deleterious effect on your growth prospects drinking water source gets contaminated and uh, the rich can always buy packaged water but that cannot be said of the poor people right so overall the development opportunities would be lost and uh, the most hit would be the socially vulnerable and the poorer communities because they have less coping options less adaptation adaptation strategies with them right <clears throat> we should see this you know as a symptom that is pollution as a symptom rather than a disease itself so we have to hit at the root cause so when we investigate we find the root causes and it has to be hit there so why has not the developing countries been able to you know point uh, point fingers at these root causes why because it has never been the central topic of political debate pollution has never been there and then the natural resources management when it comes to it it is mostly the central uh, the central tendency or uh, the structures are all centralized they are the ones who manage the natural resources and uh, never do we go for cons uh, consultation with the lower levels that is multi stakeholder model is not uh, you know adopted here emission based standards have not been effective and uh, rarely monitoring is done polluters pay principle is not in force 
right? So for the most part, polluters are not willing to internalize the causes and uh, they are not worried about the external and social costs. So external costs include, uh, you know, what happens to the environment, what happens to the poorer sections. Social costs include uh, people getting out of work because of pollution problems. So pollution is also neglected by the funding agencies. When the funding agencies give the funds, they have to have a strict outline of, you know, the uh, boxes to be ticked by uh, the you know people who are seeking funds but you know there are no such boxes you know stringent boxes are not there what remedial measures have to be taken by the you know uh, by the developing countries and India in particular economic growth is essential of course to go forward and it should not be coming at the cost of health or for that matter it should not come at the cost of uh, in a degradation of environment as a whole we should spread public awareness uh, have you know the education system uh, you know ingrained with uh, lessons on environment conservation you should develop adequate pollution linked databases this is where we lack a lot integration of uh, pollution prevention policies that is departments and ministries have to work hand in hand rather than working you know separately Strict enforcement have fines, you know, whenever there are uh, transgressions, bring them to court, you know, have a proper, uh, you know, judicial mechanism. Uh, in this regard, you can remember the NGT, which is working well. Incentivize those production units which are using eco-friendly inputs. Promote renewable energy, right? and then introduce market-based or economic instruments, right? Charges, taxes, levies, tradable permits, subsidies, these are going to go a long way uh, to you know, conserve the environment. Apart from this, uh, you have to increase the ecosystem resilience through conservation of biodiversity, that is uh, reclamation of uh, degraded lands, afforestation, so these are to be done. So what is a possible question that can be framed? As countries gain on per capita income front, their preceding levels of pollution tends to decrease. Should India follow the same path? What measures should India embrace going forward to deal with environmental degradation? So your answers have to be, see, the first part of the question talks about your Kuznets curve, environmental Kuznets curve. Explain the, ex oh, I know, environmental Kuznets curve and say that India should not wait for it, right? Wait for reaching those, you know, levels. Instead, they have to start the measures or mechanisms should be put in place so as to conserve the nature as early as possible, right? That's about it for today, folks. Thank you. Have a nice day.